You know what you're about to listen to? The Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. In the previous full-length episode, I interviewed Gustav Svanborg Eden, the skateboarding coordinator for the city of Malmö, Sweden. The conversation was long and fascinating, and I edited it down for clarity. It's a super interesting discussion about the role of skateboarding in cities and what cities can do to design for it, as well as reap the societal benefits if they do. There's a segment about the gender issue faced by the skateboarding community, which was, of course, important to include. Gustav and I discussed this at length, and I decided it was relevant and important to edit a longer version about this topic. Gender issues in skateboarding can be compared to gender issues in any number of sports and in society in general. In this extended addendum, Gustav and I discuss at length how a traditionally male-dominated culture like skateboarding can, and must, diversify to include a strong female presence. Is it possible? What are the challenges? Most importantly, what will the benefits be? The first part is from the full version of the interview, but the last part is a continuation of the conversation. From the city side and the town planner side, I mean, we have a lot of places for skating and the, the people who are the least active and need most investment for urban activity or, or um, you know, a spontaneous uh, urban activity spaces are young women in the suburbs. And uh, skateboarding still is extremely male dominated. So uh, investing a lot of money into new skate spaces when we have such a big diversity of skate spots is not necessarily a priority for everything. Right now, we're, uh, we're looking at a few more uh, projects and we're gonna keep working with using skate-friendly architecture, but we're also working particularly with uh, you know, reaching new people uh, for skateboarding, having like uh, uh, new areas where we do temporary skate parks and have skate classes and demos and that kind of thing. To, to sort of uh, develop the interest in skateboarding. Uh, we need more skaters right now, uh, more than we need more spots. Now, the question of, mm. of gender, you know, we live in two of the most gender-equal countries in the world, but yeah, skateboarding, man, it's, it's very, very male-dominated. Uh, how do you just generally, maybe not as a city, but as, you know, as a skateboarder, how do you tackle that? Because that's really how it's always been, and that seems to be a tough nut to crack to get more girls uh, onto boards. You have to see it to be it, right? The skateboarding culture has been financed by the skateboarding industry from day one. And the skateboarding industry has looked at their market and realized, oh, hang on, this is all teenage guys. How do you communicate with teenage guys? Skateboarding has been awash with drug and alcohol romanticism, really objectified women, all the kind of traditional rebellious punk teenage stuff, predictably so. But it's also meant that by using those uh, communication tools to like spark the interest of teenage guys wanting to be cool, uh, you've also alienated the female community. Women who have been interested in skating around the world have essentially looked at it as like, okay, I'm an anomaly, this is not for me. Some have braved it and become skaters, but it's been so rare that the guys have been like, yeah, you are an anomaly, this is weird, you're not a real girl or whatever, uh, because it's been like teenage dumb guys who don't know better, <laughs> and it's pathetic, you know, it's terrible. Same with, you know, LBTQI issues, and like the first famous pro skater to, to come out did that about two years ago or whatever, it's, it's so late and terrible. But I think with skateboarding becoming more mainstream and broader, and more kind of assimilated with uh, popular culture, a lot more girls have started skating, and also the visibility has increased. So the interest has been higher. Uh, from our side, we've worked very proactively with developing female skateboarding because we've in Malmö they've always seen that as a as a problem of something negative, and the things that have really worked have been yeah see it to believe it like if you communicate something about skate events or if there is a skate event make sure the girl there are girls there so in on posters in any kind of uh, communication material make sure the women are visible if you do events get women there equalize the prize money invest in the uh, development of the female skate scene also if you have a, a skate space like a skate park typically and you look at the vibe there 
Like, if you're a beginner, that's intimidating enough to just have a bunch of teenage guys, like, skating really hard and being really kind of testosterone. The testosterone vibe is really high. So to just ask anyone to step into that out of their own accord and just be a beginner or stand out is a lot. But to be a girl as well, that's asking too much. So uh, we've seen that if you create a separate time for beginners uh, and separate time for girls at the skate park so they can get comfortable in the space, develop their skills create their own social network that really really helps uh, building the community and it also uh, helps the the female skaters to develop the confidence to then be able to step into the the sort of male dominated spaces and diversify them which then leads to greater acceptance and kind of mellows that out provides a bridge for the transition between male dominance and more uh, more gender equal scene when we do skate model the street the big street event we do here we have the same budget for flying women here or to invite girls we have the same prize money for women we co-run all the heats and competitive elements so that it's not like okay the girls have their comp at nine in the morning and then the guys do the finals and that's the real show mm. we we co-run it so that it's girls and guys mixed the whole time because it's skating it's not about who wins or whatever anyways it's about the session it's about the hangout it's about the kind of cultural exchanges. We have these different strategies and we've really seen a big difference. Like Brigadier, the, the local skate organization, have gone from, I think, one female member to over 400 in 10 years. And it's escalating really quickly. And I think for girls out there in popular culture today, they uh, look around and they see girls engaged in different activities. And in particular, sports. And there's so few that aren't sexualized. Like women in tennis, women in any kind of sport are just like uh, the sexualization is so much higher than for men. And that's true in skating in some parts. Like some women are, you know, skate light dressed and so on. But still, uh, we're not there yet in skating. Uh, if you're a female skater, you can be cool by being punk by having a different sense of fashion by being into photography film music like you can have all these interests where you're allowed a space where uh, which are otherwise perhaps male dominated uh, and there's like a there's a real platform for women i think to to develop their identity and be part of this scene like uh, and and sort of uh, become uh, make use of skating and I think that has real potential. And when I see the female skate scene now, I'm kind of envious because it's like what it was like for us in the 90s. Uh, like a small community where everyone knows each other. They all like to travel to different parts of the world, uh, follow each other on Instagram. And when there's events, like people make an effort to go. And, and it's like a cohesive scene with a strong identity and lots of really cool characters. Like the girls are cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of skaters today that I you know, I think are a bit like, <laughs> like out of the dudes, like, you know, I can take or leave half of them. <laughs> but I like the female skate scene. I think it's like got a good thing going for it. But it's also perhaps a little bit, you know, raging against the machine, uphill battle, like as it maybe was in the 90s all over the world for skateboarders in cities. And now, so they also have that, maybe they have that edge that, uh, uh, that the boys don't because they are more accepted in cities around the world yeah the well essentially it's like a power dynamic guys are in a position of power now that skateboarding is more uh you know uh you're not sacrificing anything to be a skater today you're getting something from it like you get rewarded like if you're a good skater in school you get like you get girls and you get social status and that kind of thing uh, oh, whereas that's, that's where i went wrong <laughs> God, yeah fuck yeah. i missed a meeting too man <laughs> Uh, but but uh, when we were when I started, it, you were kind of like a outcast or a UFO, you know. Um, but I think female skaters still kind of have um, a little bit of, of an uphill struggle, and perhaps. Uh, uh, but I think that's changing. But I, th I still like that that strong kind of identity of having made a choice, you know. Like I liked skating, I made a choice, I became part of it, and now it's like other people that found that passion recognize it and we can bond over it i think that's stronger in the female skate scene than in the male skate scene because now people just pick up a board because it's there you know kind of a, a similar parallel when my kid was about five he wanted to play football all of his friends did it you couldn't get into any club in copenhagen I actually got him in because I volunteered to be a football coach, and they said, great, then we'll set up a new team if you're going to be a coach, because they also have a problem with coaches. Several times, parents bring a girl. You know, they're five or six, that young. 
yeah, she just loves football. She plays it all the time. She wants to play, but there's no girls' teams. Um, so can she join this team? Of course, you know. And you know, then I had to tackle that. The the, you know, and these are five and six year olds, and it's the same with boys. I think everywhere, right? And the, they always disappeared after two or three uh, tryout sessions because they were intimidated by all the other boys. They were the, the the loner, the one girl playing football, and they were better as a rule than most of the boys. But they bailed because uh, you know they were young and impressionable. But we've seen a meteoric rise in women's football now all over the world. I mean, all of a sudden we're watching it in Denmark. We're watching the Danish team get beat last week. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing. And my daughter went to football. And at that point, there were, there were too many girls. They said, yeah, we have like, we don't have enough coaches for all the girls now. So just in the past 10 years, we've seen this massive transformation of, of a male dominated sport football in the public perception to uh, you know, women and men are just both playing football. I mean, can, are you going to see that kind of sea change uh, in, in skateboarding? You're se- you say that you're seeing it now, but do you think there could be just... What is the, the tsunami that you need uh, to take it over the top? I think one thing that's happening is the Olympics. I mean, the skateboarding is going to be in the Olympics in 2020, and people are... The whole skate culture is, culture is debating about that and what the consequences are going to be. One consequence is that there's going to be uh, men and women uh, competing, and that for all the countries that haven't been exposed to skateboarding before, uh, you know, in African countries, some parts of South America, big parts of Asia, China... Uh, they're going to see both men and women competing. So it's going to be normal for both. Uh, And there are no good reasons why women shouldn't skate. I mean, actually, in football, uh, like stereotypically, uh, in uh, in your teenage years, uh, when, you know, you reach puberty and so on, uh, the physical changes that come with that uh, usually diversify, like creates differences between the two genders and so a lot of team sports you can't it's hard to keep mixed teams after the teens because the guys become faster and stronger and and uh, uh, so on because those are really valued dynamics in those sports but skateboarding should in theory have uh, an opportunity to breach that because uh, it's not just about you know jumping highest or doing the most muscly kickflip or whatever it has to do with style it has to do with creativity it has to do with trick selection and a lot of like technical skills that uh where the sort of uh, potential uh, physical gender difference shouldn't be that big uh but uh, it's hard to know that yet because the, n- the number of female skaters out there has been so small. But hopefully in the next uh, few decades, perhaps uh, skateboarding can be one of the uh, few uh, sports, I hate to call it a sport, but activities. Do you? You don't, you don't, uh, that's no, so tricky for you as No, a, but as it's a to culture. reduce it. You know, skateboarding is, is, has sport elements, it has art elements, it has... Uh, of, you know, uh, has a lot of different uh, characteristics and as soon as you call it one thing you're uh, cutting off the other stuff and that's also to cut away some of the most important valuable parts of it so uh, I mean the challenge with the Olympics for skateboarding when you set a certain format and say that it's a sport uh, the challenge for the skateboarding culture is to to show the world that skateboarding is more than that format so that skateboarding itself isn't reduced to the format you know so uh, but yeah back to women i think i mean the reason why people have uh, we see more female sports is a lot of it is like uh, gender consciousness and people fighting really hard for uh, more uh, equal reporting in sports and a lot of it also has to do with public funded sports channels uh, so uh, the the fact that uh, you know Scandinavian TV or, or Denmark because it's a uh, publicly funded organization uh, it's not okay to have gender differences in your reporting that has enabled uh, women to become more visible and as a result of course you know female uh, participation in football skyrockets because women want to play football and now they can because they see it's possible and no one's complaining no one's saying it's you know has to do with their biology or uh, whatever you know like old kind of close-minded ways of understanding gender Um, so I think you know skateboarding is going to be the same the more people see it the more normal it's going to be and I think I'm looking forward to seeing skateboarding develop by female participation because like having zones where only guys hang out and don't learn how to interact with women and just like 
not develop their uh, emotional interaction uh, is just, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily that constructive. So hopefully we can all grow as individuals and as a community and culture together, <laughs> you know. But I, I think that's true. Right, cool, all right. What a fantastic irony. One of the most male-dominated sports slash cultures might possibly have the greatest potential for leveling the gender playing field, which would be good for skateboarding, of course, but also a beacon for other sports all over the world. As Gustav and I discussed in the full-length interview, other cities may be challenging Malmo for the title of the most skate-friendly city. That's fine. On the issue of gender, yeah. I think we'd better let Malmo lead the way. They have put so much thought into this already, and the results, while still evolving, show that the city is light years ahead. That wraps up another episode of the Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Thanks for listening. And you know, remember, it's your city. Take it back. <laughs>